So this is the, uh, the 2019 Gartner Report. Uh, Axway is the uh, largest independent vendor in the API gateway space, uh, competing with you know, Google, Apogee, MuleSoft, which is now Salesforce and uh, IBM, some other names I'm sure you know. Uh, so we'll just kind of quickly jump to how we started with GitLab uh, and a little bit about our transformation story. So Axway, historically, we were mostly licensed on-premises software. So something you download and install on your data center or in your own cloud. Uh, in about 2014, we launched our first managed service. Uh, in 2016, we acquired a SaaS business called Simplicity. And then in um, 2018, we launched platform.axway.com. So what we've really been doing is making a journey from a legacy licensed software distribution model to a subscription-based cloud model. And um, we started with GitLab in um, 2016, so we were using SVN as source code management. Uh, we replaced uh, all of our code bases and uh, source code uh, moved into GitLab. Uh, we also, at that time, uh, moved from sub uh, version one uh, for defect tracking, Jira, we moved to Jira and Confluence um, for project management, agile workflow, et cetera. Uh, so one of the interesting things about uh, making this transition is that we now have cloud services as well as on-premises services and now the ability to, and the need to hook all that together and maintain security and velocity. Uh, and so, what happened in um, 2018, the business came to me as the security director and said, okay, we want to, this is our mission for 2019, we want to really be in the high performing category of software delivery. And so this comes from uh, the Dora project. And so these are some of the metrics they use to really kind of measure success and uh, high performance in software delivery. And so you can see some of the, uh, the metrics here. Uh, deployment frequency, so delivering licensed products. Traditionally, you're looking at a 12 month, sometimes 18 month sales cycle, uh, which would put you in the low end. Uh, but as we move to cloud and you move to cloud, uh, high performing businesses are now pushing new code out you know, once per hour, once per day. Uh, lead time for changes, if you are you know, in a legacy subscription model, or sorry, uh, on-premises model, you might have, you know, a quarterly release or a semi-annual release. So there's a lot of pressure to get things done and into that release and ship. Uh, High-performing organizations ship every day, so therefore new features can go out every day. If you miss a release, that's okay. You can just ship tomorrow. Uh, time to restore, looking for less than one day. Again, this is for the cloud services and change failure rate. So this is a measure of after you push a release into production, what's the rate of success versus the rate that you have to roll back. And so the business, again, this is their goal uh, for, for 2019. And so really I'm not gonna go into all of the details of how we achieve that on the uh, development side because this is really a fo focus about security. Uh, but I am gonna talk about the enablers required to achieve that from a security standpoint. So how do you meet those metrics and maintain your security while releasing several times per day? Um, so we'll talk about some of the enablers. And really this is a uh, kind of a culture, culture first. Uh, you can't really accomplish anything without passionate people that are trained and enabled and empowered to do their job. And so, again, some, some metrics here, and a lot of this model comes from um, BSIM. If you're familiar with BSIM, it's an organization building software in maturity model. And so uh, we implement a program very similar to what uh, a lot of other companies uh, uh, as a member of BSIM are doing. Uh, but basically, you have a core secure product group and so that's a product and cloud security group, and this is my team. 
Uh, and then within the development projects, we have a security champion. Uh, this is also known as a SPOC, which is a uh, security point of contact. Um, and so what's interesting here is kind of how do you scale this? You know, a, a lot of folks are here from you know, different organizations. We've got Disney, uh, we've got uh, Charter, T-Mobile, so very large organizations. Uh, so what's the gauge? Where do you, how many of these people do you need? Uh, best practices say around two to 5% is sort of a benchmark metric. At Axway, we have about 3% in the product security group. And then in the security champion program, you have at least one person per engineering project designated as the security champion. So some of those of you who raised your hand, this might be you at your company, uh, but this is the person responsible to you know, work with the product security group and make sure that security is implemented in the project uh, and work with the product security group uh, the product security group is responsible to define security best practices, develop tools, uh, deploy the tools, uh, centralize the infrastructure, and enable the security champions and the development teams to meet their security goals. Uh, on top of all that, um, you want to have a training and awareness program so that not only your SPOCs and your security team, but everyone is trained on security, the basics. So we have the white belt program, uh, you shoot for 100% attainment here across your R&D organization. 30% uh, for the Blue Belt program. This is a little more advanced security training where you're getting in and actually doing coding challenges, fixing uh, known vulnerabilities, and, uh, and doing tests about that. And then you have the Black Belt program, and this is for your elites, folks that have gone out and gotten certifications who are uh, doing presentations, who are doing blogs, and really kind of your leaders in the security program. Any questions or comments so far? Capture the flag. Oh, thank you. Uh, so training and awareness events. So capture the flag is a, uh, one of the cultural things we do where we'll go to each R&D site and host a one day capture the flag event. So we'll stand up a vulnerable server uh, with known vulnerabilities, and then there's a levels of challenges that you have to compete uh, to capture the flag. So there's a SQL injection on a web page. You have to find it. If you get it, uh, then you get the, the flag or the cookie, and you uh, then you submit it, and then you get that award. And so we do these events uh, as cultural events to get everyone thinking about security and also see in their own projects and in their own products, how things can be broken and how things can be abused and used in ways the developers never imagined. Uh, and so it's something that we do annually uh, as well as uh, uh, smaller events just to kind of get people thinking about it. And it's an op open for everyone to participate. Uh, you don't have to be on the security team. It's for all of R&D. We have sometimes uh, support and other departments uh, come in, come in, uh, compete as well. Uh, yes, we do have a red team, and uh, I'll talk about that in a second. Yes, we do. It's called uh, Security Shepherd, and if you go to the OWASP homepage, look for Security Shepherd. It's a flagship product uh, or project within OWASP. And uh, several engineers from our, our team at Axway are the leads on that project. But it's open source, so you can download it and deploy it in your own uh, environment and run your own Capture the Flag, as well as if you want to commit a new challenge, want to commit a new level, uh, you can commit right back to the project. Thank you. Um, so next, I'll talk a little bit about process and sort of framework, uh, which is another thing, key, key, fact, uh, key factor that the product security group provides. Uh, so this is just an example of our SDLC. We call it the application security bar. Uh, it's not as fun as that bar right there, but... Um, and within the application security bar, we define the different levels or uh, security gates that each application and each product 
has to pass through. Uh, and based on the type of system you're delivering would depend on whether or not you need to pass these gates. For example, if you are not uh, shipping uh, container images, then you don't have to do container analysis. So it's sort of a flexible model that adapts to the type of project that you're working on. Um, so these are just kind of the bullets or the, uh, the outline. I won't read them all off to you, but for each one, so as an example, we have the uh, third party component vulnerability. So the first bullet there, this is an example. What is the criteria to pass this? So it means that you need to run the automated security tooling. It should be integrated into your pipeline and the results are then audited and then anything with a medium or higher severity must be mitigated before you uh, commit that or before you release that into production. And so the product security group is kind of responsible for this side and then the SPOC and the development teams are responsible uh, for this side. And then I put the logo there to uh, indicate this is one of the, one of the areas where we're using and leveraging uh, the pipeline and the uh, source code control within GitLab to instrument this. Uh, so this is um, you know, a little bit more about process. Uh, this is our DevSecOps chain, if you will. Um, there's a lot going on in this, but basically you're probably familiar with the Dev DevOps loop by now. Um, this just illustrates really where our security program and our security practices layer on top of the traditional DevOps pipeline and you know, what we call DevSecOps. On the uh, left side, you have kind of the traditional application security. On the right, more the cloud security operations side of the side of things. Um, so the gentleman who asked about red teaming, uh, this is uh, the slide I have, which uh, illustrates where that comes into the process. So we do have an in-house red team that does you know manual penetration testing as part of uh, as part of the delivery. And then we also use third-party pen testers to test the products once they're either at release or now in production, because most of the times for the third party, it needs to be released to production. Are there any other questions about Red Team or just wondering? Okay. And so just kind of uh, another alphabet soup of uh, vendors here, and I'm not endorsing any one of these, uh, but just to give anyone who's interested uh, an idea of what our kind of ecosystem looks like. Um, so you can see some of, the, some of the tools we use and some of the systems in play throughout the life cycle. And so what I'm going to focus really on the next section is kind of talking about you know, what we're doing um, in the testing, uh, coding stages, testing and coding, and, and the release stage. Uh, the traditional model, uh, we would have you know, early on in the development of a new system, we call that your planning phase, you sit down with a security team and do a security threat model. Uh, this can be a manual whiteboard exercise, or we also have tooling that we use to facilitate that. Uh, having a globally distributed development organization, we can't always fly to each development site to do a sit down threat model, so we use some tools to do that. Um, and then you do your testing, and then when you get to your release, then you have to do a final security review, which is called an FSR. Uh, so this is another kind of meeting with the security team where we sit down and see, okay, what were the results of the scan? Did you meet all of the requirements that we defined? Did you mitigate all of the risks that were identified in the threat model um, and so forth? And if they pass all of the gates, then they can release into production. So back to the first slide of the challenges we were presented, that all works really, really well when you have the time to do a threat model and to do a manual sit down with the security team and do a final security review. But as you're doing continuous delivery and you wanna ship 
every day, uh, the time from inception of an idea, creating an issue or creating a ticket to releasing that ticket doesn't really give you a whole lot of time to do you know, all of those manual steps. So we needed a way to automate the steps that can be automated and done in the pipelines and in the branches, as well as make sure that we were still covering the bases and doing the threat modeling and doing the other steps that might take a little bit more time. And so uh, just kind of a, a look at what that testing pipeline looks like. So in the continuous integration side, this is where we're doing the static analysis. We use Fortify for static code scanning, uh, dependency check, retire JS to look at the third party components and make sure there's no known CVEs or no known vulnerabilities against the third party components used in the code. Uh, if there's containers, we're scanning them with uh, Twistlock. And then uh, once it's sort of running and uh, on the dynamic analysis side, we use tools like uh, Inside VM, App Spider to do dynamic application scanning and to find vulnerabilities that you would detect in your REST APIs or in your application, uh, if it's a web app uh, or just in the API layer uh, from a dynamic standpoint. So we use a correlation system to kind of take all of that data and all of the findings and remove duplicates and correlate things uh, and then throw that up in a dashboard for the teams. Uh, and so one of the things I'm going to talk about is the continuous security report. And so this is something that the team is doing right in the pipeline itself so that they can take all of this data and not have to go to another dashboard to look at something, but they'll see it right inside their build and they'll see it right inside their pipeline so that as long as I've done all this and everything's green, I can release to production. Uh, so yeah, some of these are commercial products, commercial solutions that we're using. Uh, dependency check is an open source. And there's some other open source tools that we use. So in the Lean Scan, do I use Rest for the point of your uh, Some run at the branch level, uh, but most of them are post-merge. Yeah. That's, and that's the kind of the problem that CSR was invented to, to resolve the continuous security review. Uh, another aspect of this is really giving the data to the developers and you know, really kind of driving continuous improvement with the data. And so uh, we've come up with a few mechanisms to do that. Um, kind of on the, um, where we started is here, where this is where we do our initial security review, final security, security review, and surface that up in a dashboard so it, the teams can go in and look, the project owners, product managers, product owners can go and look and see, okay, how's my product doing? And they can also see how they compare to other products so everyone in the company has access to the dashboard. And we, um, you know, when we do have a meeting with the, the team to do an ISR and FSR, then we have, you know, we track what was the status at that point? And then we set an agreement to say, okay, by next release, here's where we expect you to be. And then we work with them to get them to that level. <laughs> we built this. Yeah, that's us. And this is Grafana. So that's just, uh, I believe that's open source. Uh, so I'll, I'll touch on this, this slide again, or this graph again, but to the question of is this running in the branch or is this in the, uh, the merged build, this is what the uh, CSR report will do, is it runs in your branch and it'll go and pull the latest results from your threat model to say, okay, did the threat model pass, then this is a green. Even though I didn't do a threat model for this branch, I'm at least checking what was the latest status and if it's older than, say, two weeks, then it would fail and that would be a red and I wouldn't be able to ship. And so whether it's running in the branch or if it's running you know, out 
it will go out and fetch the latest result and then surface that up. So the team knows when I want to go hit deploy, if I don't have all greens there, then, then I'm not going to be allowed to ship. Okay. So the next couple of slides, uh, again, I'll get going a little bit to the weeds. Oh, question? Yeah, that's a great, great question. Um, and it <clears throat> depends too on the maturity of the team. Uh, so um, for the audio, the question was who does the triage or do the teams themselves triage false positives and look at false positives? Uh, for a mature team, I mentioned the SPOC role. A lot of times the SPOCs, it's their responsibility to review the scans, review the results and to triage the findings. And then my team will We'll go and audit them occasionally, um, but most of the time, um, you know, once they reach a certain level of maturity, there's no need to do that audit. And then, of course, if there is a question, hey, this tool is showing us this vulnerability, we think it's a false positive, we think the tool's broken, then it's our job to go fix it. Great question. Um, so I think I'm still good on time, so I'm gonna go through these next couple of slides. Um, so this is just a little bit more detail on that CSR process I talked about. So again, I'm senior director, so I don't get into the pipeline every single day. So uh, do, my, do my best with these slides. Uh, but here's a new feature that we're launching. Uh, so within GitLab, we have a CSR profile, which is part of the repo and as part of the branch. And that just says for this product, what security gates are required. And then the runner will uh, download uh, a Docker image with the test instrumentation, with the test tools in the, run in the runner from the image, uh, and then run the scans that it needs to in the branch, and then pull the results, like I said, from the other tools that are running you know, on the main branch. And so they can get the latest static analysis, analysis scan. So static analysis, if you worked with this, these types of tools, some of them, if you have a big code base and if you're working on a monolith, a monolith application, it could take you a day, sometimes longer, to run that static scan. So that's why we don't scan, do the full static analysis in the branch, uh, but pull the latest from the last run. But then if the last run is over, older than say one week, then it would fail. So in this example, um, there's uh, a known false positive with Twistlock and it's already been suppressed by the Spock. And so the rest of the gates will pass and, and the pipeline will, will succeed. And then you can, you, can, you can go and merge that. Uh, in this example, I had the suppression, I rerun it. The false positive is still there and it's still suppressed, but now we found a new issue. So since we found a new issue, then we block, block the pipeline and we block the merge and they have to go fix that new issue. And then what about the version that's running in production. We want to make sure you know, if we're scanning, we're running scans, a lot of times we're scanning the branch, we're scanning the merge, we're scanning the dev branch. Uh, but what about the release branch that's already out there in production? So what we also do is every day we'll scan the release branch just to make sure there's no new zero days that you know, we're not going to, we might not detect in the dev. Uh, and so we run every day, we'll run the daily scan and then if we catch a zero day, then that would fail the CSR. And then when your branch runs, it would pick up that result and also fail your merge so that somebody knows to go look at that, that new finding. <clears throat> and again, so if everything passes successfully, then there's no requirement to meet up with security. There's no manual approval from security. 
you've got to go from security and you can deploy this into production. And so that's you know, just a quick overview of some of the uh, processes and what we implemented to help our de development teams achieve that uh, metric and achieve their goals. And uh, like I said, we launched platform.axway.com earlier this year, and that was a, a large part of the uh, SaaS delivery and the continuous delivery initiatives to get us there. And just kind of looking at how we stacked up, you know, when working with the team. These are their, their metrics on where they are today. So in the high category for you know, deployment frequency, lead time for changes, time to restore, change failure rates. And they said, well, don't get complacent, don't get lazy, because here's where we want to be for 2020. They want to go to the elite. So now we're working on uh, how do we increase the velocity and do this at a greater scale with more of the teams because there's new products also now shipping into platform.axway.com and they'll also be trying to release uh, with the same velocity. So that was exactly 29 minutes and 44 seconds, so. <laughs> any questions? Yes, questions? Yeah, sure, I'd be happy to take any questions. Sir. Yeah, so uh, as far as giving the feedbacks to the devs, um, yeah, we have ThreadFix and the PSG dashboard, which I showed. And so during their uh, initial security review or final security review, you know, where we will be meeting with them to review those results, so they can go right to ThreadFix or they can go right to the dashboard and see those, those results. And then if they want to deep dive into the findings, um, they have those in JIRA. And so they can go into JIRA and see their, their findings and, uh, and they can you know, put them into their release and mark them for uh, the target release. Uh, today, for my team, uh, ThreadFix is our source of, source of truth. Yeah. Uh, I saw your training, obviously, but what type of reference architecture do you provide your developers to enable them to implement all this? So there's CI.yaml. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, so, um, so for reference architecture, we do provide uh, sort of some templates. So we have our own, so our dashboard, for example, is a, is a Java project, and we have some other uh, projects that we support. And so we'll provide an example pipeline for both GitLab and for Jenkins, because not everyone yet is on GitLab. So we provide them an example pipeline. And then um, we, we'll also work with them to get them, you know, if, it, if it's not running or something isn't working correctly, then we work with them to, to set it up. Uh, but we provide those reference examples, uh, and then they can they can clone them, you know, into their own project, and then just use that as part of their as building their pipeline. And then we also provide um, sort of as reference or a framework uh, some secure uh, code bases. So we have an Axway Defense framework, which is um, libraries that they can use in their code that do you know whitelisting. Um, encryption and, and some of the you know, security requirements so that they don't have to go write their own. Thank you, Brian. Okay, thank you everyone. I appreciate your time and attention. Thank you very much.